Hey guys, welcome to Digital Screenie channel on YouTube. And if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, well, what's stopping you? I know you enjoy the content and more importantly, you find the content of this channel to be very educational. So please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And also do like these videos because that tells me exactly what type of videos you like and what type of videos are kind of neutral. Don't hit the dislike button. Okay, let's jump into today's topic, which is conditional GANs, conditional generative adversarial neural networks. Let's start by understanding GANs and then slowly get into why we need conditional GANs and what these mean and what type of applications are out there. And this video is going to be uh, non-coding. So we establish a good understanding of what these are. And in the next couple of tutorials, let's go ahead and write some code for conditional GANs, for actually GAN and then conditional GANs and see if we can also incorporate a couple of these variations of conditional GANs uh, uh, so let's go ahead and start uh, getting a quick understanding. First of all, let's start by looking at GAN. I have done a couple of videos in the past on this topic, but uh, it has been a while. I'm not sure how many of you watched those, but if you're watching this for the first time and trying to understand generative adversarial networks, here is a crash course. Well, it, they are called generative adversarial networks because you're generating data. You're generating data. In this case, you're generating images. Again, generating means you're generating fake data. That may look realistic, but it is fake. Adversarial because the network has two components that are adversarial to each other. One is the generator and the other is a discriminator. Okay, the generator is trying to fake, meaning the generative part, it's the generating these images, obviously, fake images when it's generating these images and the discriminator is trying to catch it and say, nah, -uh, this is fake or this is real. That's what discriminator is trying to do. So discriminator doesn't want to be fooled and generator is trying to fool. And network is just a network, right? I mean, network is just a neural network. So no further explanation there. So let's move on. So here is a uh, high level overview of generative adversarial networks. Let's start by uh, looking uh, from left to right, okay? So what goes in as an input to the generator is what they call latent vector. You can call it random noise, or it's basically a vector of a given size. In my example, I'll be using a vector of size 100. That means there are 100 numbers, random numbers, that are feeding in as a seed to my generator. The generator takes that vector and tries to convert that into a fake image. How? That vector, it gets shaped, it gets upsampled, it gets downsampled, whatever happens in the generator, we'll have a look at it later on. But the output of this generator is basically, it's taking in this vector as input and then provides a fake image as an output. How good is this fake image? Well, that depends upon how good the generator is at generating these, meaning we have to train it for a while to be able to generate realistic looking images that are worthy enough for the discriminator to be confused of. Meaning the whole point of generator is to make sure the discriminator doesn't catch this fake uh, images or fake data. So how do we train the discriminator? Well, we provide real images and fake images to the discriminator. Typically we divide these into 50-50. If a batch has 32 images, 16 of them will be real images and the other 16 would be fake images and we train the discriminator to be able to discriminate between the real versus fake. So discriminator is nothing but a binary classifier. It's a fancy name, but discriminator is just a binary classifier. Cla uh, and, and it just classifies between real or fake. Okay, so based on this, how well it did, of course, we feed the information back and we get the discriminator loss, right? I mean, this is this is how we are. The whole point is minimize the discriminator loss. And uh, uh, also very similarly, generator loss, we are going to provide it back to generator so the generator gets trained. One thing you to note is while the generator is, uh, uh, sorry, let me go back. Let me go forward one step and finish this off. The, I already mentioned this, right? I mean, the whole point of generator, the goal of generator is to maximize the probability of the discriminator making a mistake. And discriminator's goal is to maximize the probability of uh, identifying real versus fake. So when you train this, when you train this, the discriminator is usually fixed 
and you train the generator and generator is fixed and you train the discriminator we'll see these uh, in a minute actually so the five steps of training this generative adversarial network step number one of course you define your GAN architecture based on the application what does that mean well your generator can just generate 32 by 32 by 3 images just by putting together a few uh, a few uh, let's say convolutional layers and dense layers you can start with a dense layer obviously you will be starting with a dense layer right I mean you have a vector there you start with a dense layer and then you convert that you reshape that into two dimensions so you can add some convolutional layers and then the output can be a, uh, a an image of I don't know 32 by 32 by 3 in this case yeah so you define again architecture but what if you would like to generate an image by using a segmented mask as an input? You have a segmented mask, but you would like to generate realistic looking images. In that case, you know how we segment, we do semantic segmentation, we use UNET, correct? In that case, your generator can have an architecture of a UNET. So the GAN is just a general concept. You have a generator and a discriminator that's it and the architecture depends upon your specific application okay so define the GAN architecture based on the application and train the discriminator to distinguish between real versus fake we understand that and train the generator to fake the data that can fool the discriminator and continue this process for multiple epochs and finally save the generator model to create new realistic data because we really don't care much about discriminator discriminator is there to tell us is this real or fake and uh, in fact discriminator is there so we know that uh, uh, that's a scapegoat we are trying to fool the discriminator and to do that we are improving by doing that I mean we are actually improving the generator and if the discriminator is confused if it gets 50-50 when you supply your real or fake images, then we know that that's the best you can achieve, right? So that's what, uh, uh, that's why we don't really care about discriminator. You can throw that out, but you keep the generator model so you can uh, generate future realistic looking uh, fake data. Okay, now uh, I already mentioned this when training the discriminator, you hold the generator constant. And when you train the generator, you hold the discriminator constant because you are training one against the static adversary. Yeah. So uh, here is a few lines of code again. We'll, we'll go through this in our next video when we get to the actual code, but I want to include this so you get multiple exposure to this code and appreciate how everything really makes sense. Okay, so starting with the, uh, I'm still talking about regular GAN. This is not conditional GAN. I'll get to conditional GAN in a minute. Okay, so the discriminator, let's start by looking at discriminator and then generator and then the combined uh, GAN model. So starting with discriminator, what is a discriminator? It's just a binary classifier to discriminate between true or fake. So it's basically, uh, is this a, a cat or not cat? Is this a malarial infected cell or not a malarial infected cell, right? It's exactly the same type of application, except here it is, is it true or fake? So for that, what do you need? Well, I'm using sequential method because we can achieve this. Again, you can sometimes you have to use functional API to define the model, which is exactly what we'd be doing with our conditional GAN because it takes multiple inputs. But for now, let's just keep it simple. You can use sequential method because it's one layer after the other. So the first layer is convolution layer in this example. And then I'm using instead of regular uh, ReLU, I'm using leaky ReLU with a slope or alpha factor of 0 0.2 and then another condition, uh, convolution layer uh, with a with again another activation of leaky ReLU right there and then only two convolution layers and then we are flattening it out and uh, that's it and we have our output layer right there it you can define much more complex if you if you think this is not enough this is just a simple binary classifier that's it so we have an activation of sigmoid because this is a binary classifier and i'm using atom optimizer and this part is pretty much the you have seen it many times uh, if you if you are a regular viewer of my uh, videos so this is a typical discriminator there is no different than our binary classifier now if you look at generator what should the generator do it should give us a final image of a specific size, whatever the size that we uh, desire in this case. So if I go back here, the input shape of the discriminator is 32 by 32 by three. That means my images that are 
going into the discriminator, true and fake, right? They need to be of size 32 by 32 by 3. This is exactly why my generator, the last layer, should be designed such a way that I get an output of 32 by 32 by 3. Everything else is designed to give me 32 by 32 by 3 size output. And what do we start with? We start with a vector. If I go back, sorry for going through all the animation, we start, what is the input to the generator? It's just a vector of a given size. You can call it random noise or you can call it a latent vector. Whatever that is, that vector is the input to the generator. So let's go back now and here we are. So our input dimension is the latent dimension, What is whatever that latent vector is. So for example, it can be a size of 100. Okay. Now, and I added something called number of nodes, like how many dense layers should we start with? I just defined this as 128 by 8 by 8 because with that, I know that I can reshape that. Uh, I mean, I should have just written that as 8 multiplied by 8 by 128. Either way, I want to reshape my number of nodes right there into 8 by 8 by 128. Why? Because once it's in this shape, I know I can work my way back from 8 by 8, 128 to 16 by 16 by whatever, you know, 128 to 32 by 32 and finally to 32 by 32 by 3, right? That's our goal. So that's exactly why I start with these many number of nodes right there. And my input dimension is uh, 100. That's the latent vector as input. And leaky relu as usual, and I'm reshaping my dense layers into 8 by 8 by 128. And then I'm doing convolution operation, except in this case, I'm doing convolution transpose. Think of this as upscaling or upsampling. OK, I'm doing convolution transpose and 128 right there. So what this gives me is if it is a size of four by four with a stride of two by two, this will be eight by eight becomes 16. Again, sit down and do the math if this is confusing to you, but I'm sure most of you find this to be intuitive. OK. Uh, 8 by 8 with a uh, patch size of 4 by 4 and stride of 2 by 2 or kernel size of 4 by 4 and stride of 2 by 2 gives us 16 by 16. We'll do exactly the same operation one more time. So it gives us 32 by 32 by 128. And finally, my convolution layer, the final convolution layer is going to give me three channels, 32 by 32 by 3. And uh, I'm using a tan H activation in this case and uh, so on. So this is, this is our uh, generator. Now, one difference between discriminator and generator. Discriminator, you see, I have model.compile. Generator is just a model. I'm not compiling it here because we are training this generator using the combined discriminator and generator model. What does that mean? Well, let's look at the next screen. A combined GAN is where you combine your generator and discriminator together. But we do not want to train the discriminator as part of this. We only want to train the generator. If you are confused, let's go back. Discriminator is trained right here because we have model.compile and we are training this. Generator is not trained here, but it's trained as part of your combined model. That's why the first step you do when you define a GAN, a combined model, for obviously the inputs are going to be generator and discriminator, right? So this and this. These two models are your input right here. First thing first, I'm going to set my discriminator as non-trainable. We just talked about it because we want to uh, train discriminator separately. And then we need to connect these generator and discriminator. So I'm just going to use a regular sequential method and model.add generator, model.add discriminator. So it's going to add all of that generator uh, you know, uh, layers and all the discriminator layers, except in this case, the discriminator layers are non-trainable and generator uh, layers are trainable. That's it. And then we have trainable layers there. So let's go ahead and compile the model. And now we can train the generator. Remember, discriminator, you're training separately. Generator, you're training it via the combined model. OK. Now, the GAN training process in plain English. How do we train it? How do we train this combined generator? So for again, if you watch my previous video, you know how to train a model not just by doing model.fit, but by actually writing a couple of for loops, one for the epochs, one for the number of batches, right? So this is where it's going to help you out. So for number of epochs, if it is 100, for 100 epochs, and for number of batches, if you have a batch size of 16, 
and you have 5,000 images, you have about 300, uh, uh, you know, uh, batches or iterations. So for those batches, pick a half batch of real images. So if your batch size is 16, eight images would be real, eight images would be fake because you want to train the discriminator on both of these 50-50. We just saw the graphic earlier, right? So pick half batch of real images and then train the discriminator on this half batch of real images. Obviously, when I say train, that means it's updating the weights. And pick another half of fake images, yeah, eight fake images, and then train the discriminator on that half. You can average these two, uh, you know, losses if you want, but this is what we are tra uh, trying to train our discriminator on. And now come down to generator. And first of all, you need to generate a latent vector, right? So you need to generate a random vector of size 100 in our example. That is our input to the generator. So go ahead and generate that and label these fake images because our generator is generating fake images, right? Label these images as real. Instead of label, labeling them as fake, label them as real. Why? Because we want to fool the discriminator. That's the whole point. So label them as real and train the GAN model, combined generator and discriminator. Obviously, when I say train the GAN model, the discriminator is not being trained. It's kept non-trainable and only the generator is being trained. So this is how the generator is going to get better. Discriminator is going to get better at the same time. And once the number of epochs are done, go ahead and save the generator model. And the next screen shows exactly the code uh, code for that. We are going to go through this code again in the next video, so don't worry about it too much. I'm going to share this in the next video after I'm done with the next video. So, But for now, I'm using this as a prop to explain you every step that it is uh, that the generator uh, GAN actually uh, involves. So now we are going to train, just like I said, first of all, how many batches? And you divide the number of batches by two. That's our batch, half batch. And for Epoch in range number of epochs, or for i, I should have changed that to epoch, and for batch in range batch per epoch. So here we are going through epochs, here we are going through number of batches. X real, Y real, we need to write a function that gives us real images. We also need to write another function that gives us fake images. Okay, so this is our real images, this is our fake images. Once you get your real images, you just train your uh, discriminator loss, real, and then discriminator loss fake. So this is a discriminator part. And then for our generator part, you have your generating the latent points. We'll have to write a function that generates a random vector of size 100 or whatever the random vector size needs to be. And that goes in as the input to our generator right there. And our Y values for the generator, it's basically all ones. Because again, like I said, we want to fool the discriminator into thinking that these are real, so we are labeling them as one. Fake would be labeled as zero, okay? So the Y fake right there would be labeled as zero. So now our, uh, uh, now we, we are ready to train our uh, generator via the GAN model and we are going to train it on X GAN and Y GAN. That's it. After this training is done, you just save the generator, give it a name and use that to generate new images. Even if you understand this 50%, that's a success, especially if you have, haven't have looked at GAN in the past. The next video, hopefully you'll get a bit closer to 100%, but let's move on to looking at conditional generative adversarial networks, the title of this entire video. So, so far you understand GAN. Now, what is conditional GAN? So this is the image that we looked at before. This is the standard GAN. But what, how to control the type of images generated? For example, uh, what if you want a Mona Lisa wearing glasses? This latent vector, the random noise that you are providing, is a vector in the latent space. Okay, what does that mean? When you train a generator with some inputs, the inputs are between certain range. Let's say the inputs go between minus one and one. This vector, the values go between minus one and one. So your face probably uses, uh, you know, numbers from certain range. And your sunglasses probably come from a different range and something else will come from different range. Now, just to make the explanation a bit more clear, uh, if you're looking at MNIST digits, 
0 through 9. If you provide a random noise vector, you don't know if the image that's going to be generated is, is a 0 or a 1 or a 2 or a 3. But if you know that, hey, in the latent space, these values will yield you a digit of 5. And by picking in that from that cluster, if you just pick like one number randomly, your 5 may look in a different way. But all of those numbers would be 5s, different variations of 5. If you go from that to the next, probably a cluster that's right next to it, maybe you will get a value 6 because it looks very close to 5 and these clusters are close by. If you have a cluster that's far away, that's probably, I don't know, uh, 7. It doesn't look like 5 or 6. It looks a bit different. So that cluster, how do you know where those clusters are located? Right? So this is the problem with a GAN that's blindly trained. You don't know the mapping of the latent vector space to the actual features in the image or to the actual attributes, I should say, of the images that you're trying to generate. So this is where the conditional part comes into picture. Conditional is basically conditioning your GAN using additional information. That additional information can be labels, for example. So a GAN model generates random image from the domain, like I just explained, and the relationship between the points in the latent space to the images, it's it's very hard to map. This is why we want to condition this. So a GAN can be trained so both the generator and discriminator are conditioned on the class label. What does that mean? In our case, when we are training the uh, generator and discriminator, in addition to the images, we can provide a class label, 0 to 9 for our MNIST example, and then train the model. That way, we know that, okay, the latent vectors for number five, if you want to generate digit number five, you know where, uh, you know, that's located. So that's what, uh, and that's basically an example of class label, but it can be other modalities. Instead of class label, you can actually provide a different image. This is where I can go back to my semantic segmentation, segmented uh, mask. You provide that as an input, and then you expect a realistic looking uh, image, whether it is a satellite image or whether it is a microscope image, a realistic image to be generated. To do that, you, while training, you need to supply your masks in addition to your original images. So it's reverse semantic segmentation in this example that I just provided. So a conditional generative adversarial network, you are basically providing additional information to your GAN. That's it. And the train generator model can be used to generate images of a given type, and that's our goal. And GAN can be conditioned using other image modalities, like I already mentioned. So image to image translation is an example of that. If you ever heard of pix to pix, this falls into this category. And uh, it's performed by feeding the class label to both discriminator and generator. I already mentioned that. Apparently, I have a way of talking before I actually show you the text, but either way reinforcement is always good. So here is the same uh, flow chart, I should say, modified to show you the conditional GAN. Previously, we only had the latent vector going into the generator and generator generating the fake images and real images 50-50 go into your discriminator. Now, in addition to your latent vector, okay, now we have a conditional data. The example I'm showing you here is labels. This can be anything else other than not just labels, but to keep things simple, let's just think of these as labels. So what happens to these labels? These labels go in to your discriminator. These labels are added to your random noise and the combined you know, uh, vector or tensor goes into your generator. So previously the generator only used latent vector. Now we are actually concatenating both latent vector and your labels together. How can you combine a latent vector of different dimensions and uh, uh, your conditional data of different dimensions? I mean, don't you need something else? So that all of that, again, we talked about embedding layers. So our conditional data here we'll use an embedding layer to convert this, uh, let's say, uh, integer encoded values. I'm searching for words here. 
integer encoded values into vectors and then add them together. But that details I'm leaving out for now at a high level. The combined input to the generator is just your latent vector plus the condition data. And this conditional data also goes in as the input to the discriminator in addition to our real images and fake images. Everything else remains the same. That's it, okay? And uh, okay, let me go to the next level. I'm, I'm struggling to find uh, ways to simplify the explanation. So whenever I pause, maybe that's what I'm thinking. So I apologize guys for wasting a few more seconds of your time. Uh, so now let's look at the discriminator. Remember previously our discriminator was just a binary classifier. That's it. We just had a sequential method. We added a couple of convolution layers and a dense layer and we called it. That's it, a binary classifier. This is a bit more involved, primarily because we have two inputs here, right? What is our input to our discriminator? The latent vector and also these images. So now let's get here and then see, first of all, my input shape here is 32 by 32 by three. This is the size of my image that's actually going in. And the other input is number of classes equals to 10. Remember, we did not have this in our regular GAN. This is only in our conditional GAN. Why do we have this? So we can provide a label input to the uh, model. So first of all, the top portion here is uh, related to label and the bottom portion here is uh, related to your image right there. And then we are going to add them together. So let's go through almost line by line. Again, I'll go through these in a couple of videos from now when we talk about conditional GANs, but again, uh, this can be, uh, I hope you'll find this to be useful, this exercise. So first let's start by uh, getting our labeled input ready. So if you think of MNIST or CIFAR, the labels are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? So meaning the shape of our label is one. So my input label is that, and now I'm going to add an embedding layer. So for each of my labels, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm going to uh, convert those into a vector of size 50. And embedding layer means it's trainable. It's not just a hard encoded integer values. These are trainable values that we initiate using, uh, using uh, some random method. And please watch my video on the topic of embedding layers a couple of videos ago to get more clarity on this if you don't uh, understand what these are already. Okay, and I'm using functional way of defining this. As you can see, again, last three videos, I did them for a reason. So you understand this part of the code. So I'm using the functional API of Keras to define this model. Our label input is uh, embedding with 50, a vector size 50. And then I define something called number of nodes which is my input shape, zero input shape one. In this example, I'm going to use 32 by 32 uh, images, right? So this is of shape 32 by 32. Why? Because I can actually get this into a shape that's ready for concatenation. Because when we add input one, this is important, so let me go back. When you want to add these with, uh, uh, with these values, meaning our random noise is converted to, by the generator, is converted to a vector of size, what, 32 by 32 by, sorry. Our generator will generate images of size 32 by 32 by 3. Our input real images are of size 32 by 32 by 3. So if I get my uh, label vector to the size of 32 by 32, I can concatenate because they're of the same shape. There you go. <laughs> so that's my number of nodes, and that's how many dense uh, nodes I'm going to have right there. Once I have that, I'm going to reshape that into 32 by 32 by 1. And this is ready to be concatenated. And what is my input image size? 32 by 32 by 3. And what happens when you concatenate 32 by 32 by 3 with 32 by 32 by 1? Well, you get 32 by 32 by 4. Four channels because three for the image and one for, the, uh, one for our label. Hopefully this part makes sense because this is the fundamental uh, you know, essence of conditional generative adversarial networks. Okay. After this, everything else is pretty much the same as before. So once you have these two inputs ready, you already concatenated this. So our merge is the input, and then it goes to con, leaky relu, con, leaky relu, flatten, dropout, and this is the output. This part is exactly same as our uh, regular GAN. It's just that the this part, we are getting the data ready. 
And finally, this part is also pretty much the same, except you see when we define our model, it's not just one single input, it's two inputs, image input and label input. Output, we only have one output. Again, please look at uh, my video on functional API. I did talk about multiple inputs and we did plot and we have a, a very nice uh, visualization. We had a very nice visualization of this uh, inputs. So uh, I think it's almost necessary for you to watch the last three videos if you're still confused here. Okay, this is our discriminator generator, very similar. We'll modify our regular generator just by providing the class information we are going through exactly pretty much the same path here we have an embedding layer and then we define the number of nodes there and we shape this back into a shape of uh, latent dimensions latent vector input because what goes into generator is the latent vector and then we have a uh, you know the dense leaky relu and then we are concatenating our generator and the and the uh, label information right there and we upscale that vector back to the size of 32 by 32 by 3 and you know that the model inputs are are a latent vector input for generator and the label input and you have one output layer okay and finally you combine the gans uh, the, the sorry the generator and discriminator so the input to your GAN is your generator model and discriminator model of course we want our discriminator to be non-trainable just like our GAN and now we are going to connect the generator and discriminator so we get the noise and we get the label pretty much the same I, I think this part is pretty much the same so I don't I don't think we need to spend a lot of time except you can see that wherever we used to have uh, just a uh, you know without the label now we have label as one of the inputs yeah when you define your model you have the noise and you have the label that's the only difference right now okay uh, and how do we train this again i covered this in the last three videos right one of the videos was about how do you write your own uh, for loops to train to train these in epochs and batches. So that's exactly going to help you right here. So for I in range number of epochs, this is going through epochs and this is going through number of batches, right? And X, uh, again, pretty much you're putting this in the loop. Let's not waste time talking about this unless uh, I can't even think of anything that you haven't looked at under regular GAN. This is exactly same as what we are doing under regular GAN. No additional tricks here. Obviously make sure that the inputs you have your labels as inputs in addition to your x values okay uh, now finally let's look at a few applications of conditional GANs so you can decide whether conditional GANs are useful for your interests or not so a few uh, screenshots here but I'm going to talk about uh, at least three I believe or four of these applications starting with image to image translation my favorite one which is pix to pix you have one image and you want to you can also call this domain adaptation or domain changing you are changing the domain of an image from one domain to the other when you go from uh, semantic segmented image or mask to realistic looking images when you go from uh, uh, you know when you go from uh, a satellite image or an aerial image to a uh, you know street level image you can realistically you can convert these into into these type of images you can just take i mean literally uh, this is fun you can actually hand paint use your paintbrush tool to paint some of these semantic segmented uh, uh, or a mask that looks like semantic segmentation and generate realistic looking buildings or streets or uh, microscope images aerial images it's up to you you can use this to color black and white images and uh, it's up to your imagination as long as one thing as long as you have equivalent pairs of images for this image while training I need to have an equivalent version of original image for a sketch I need to have an original image of that handbag in this case and if you want to convert your uh, uh, snow images into a non snow images or a day image to a night image again you need to have the pairs of images and hundreds thousands of these images that's the requirement I bet that's exactly what I captured here it takes an image as input and maps it to a output with different properties and the system requires pairwise correspondence between images during training so you always need this pair input black and white output color image and then you can train the GAN network and these work amazingly well actually 
Another example, CycleGAN. This is very similar to pix to pix except in this case, you do not need a pairwise correspondence. You still need two Im sets of images. You still need, for example, a whole bunch of zebra images and a whole bunch of horse images. But then the same image need not be, uh, but the images need not be corresponding. That's what I'm trying to say here. This image should be relatable to this image. This image is related to this image, right? So every image is related, like the train image and the X and Y are related here. Here, X and Y are not related. I mean, in this case, it's showing you an example of output, but then you have one set of images that are uh, X, one set of images that are Y, but uh, it, 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 learns the, uh, it learns the features as part of our training. So it transforms one set of images that could belong to another set. You can uh, you can make your horses look like zebras. You can uh, uh, you can take uh, I think this looks like a Yosemite image. You can take this summer image and then uh, make it look like okay how does it look like in winter and paintings right. So you can kind of take a photograph and then see okay if Monet image or Van Gogh or whoever uh, you know did this how does it look like. And for this obviously you do not have a photograph and equivalent version of Van Gogh painting obviously but the way you train this is take a whole bunch of photographs and take a whole bunch of Van Gogh paintings and train uh, your cycle GAN and then supply a new image and then you'll get uh, how that image would look like if Van Gogh painted it so that's what cycle GAN is and what else do I have super resolution so it is again uh, uh, increases the resolution of images by adding uh, the details and uh, it's it it works very fine, but don't expect it to show your original realistic image back. For example, if you look at this, if you just look at this is the original image, right? And this is the super resolution GAN, and this is other network right there, and this is by cubic interpolation, I guess. But if you compare these two, this image looks much better than the SR ResNet and by cubic. Obviously, this is much, much better. But this is not same as your original image. So don't expect you to, to increase your resolution to your original image. This is why I'm a bit worried about super resolution uh, using GANs for scientific images. For art, it's okay. But for scientific images, you don't want to miss real information. You don't want to add information that's not there. What do I mean by that? Well, look at uh, this guy's crown right there. You see how there is sun right here? You see, it's it's not there because it's trying to reconstruct based on other information it has in this image. So it's you're not going to get this intricate details right there. If you watch this closely, you'll see that there are a lot of fine details that are missing. You see this fine, like there seems to be a lizard right there. There seems to be a dragon or something right here. That's completely gone. Okay, so you're not going to get your original input quality back, but then the image would look much, much uh, uh, higher resolution, higher, uh, you know, compared to your original blurred image. That's super resolution. And finally, I think I should end by, uh, there are many, many applications. Uh, go ahead and search for them. But finally, text to image synthesis. Here, uh, these images are actually generated based on, uh, based on uh, just a text. You just type, this flower has overlapping pink pointed petals surrounding a ring, that's pretty detailed, of short yellow filaments. It takes this and then generates the images for you, okay? If you just use regular GAN, apparently it's not that great. It looks okay. Uh, uh, there is something called stack GAN and st I'm not familiar with these. I'm just showing you that this could be done. I haven't explored with these stack GANs. Obviously I'm familiar with GAN and uh, not, or, vanilla conditional GAN, I would say this one. I'm not familiar with these two, but maybe eventually I'll teach myself how to do this tag GAN stage two and record another video sometime in future. But as you can see, this is pretty amazing. This is pretty detailed and amazing and that looks very realistic. Okay, so this with this, I think I should end this long. Again, this became this video became rather a bit longer than I wanted this to be, but I hope you learned enough information that provides a, a, a good foundation for us to understand the next two, three, four videos. Then I'm going to pick a couple of these examples and show you how to put together a conditional GAN. First of all, how to put together a GAN, a, uh, a 
basic conditional GAN and picks to picks and so on. So please stay tuned. Again, subscribe to this channel and let's meet in the next video, guys.